bring in Tom Pelissero, NFL Network reporter, part of the NFL Network's live coverage of the scouting combine that will run through March 5th. You go to these press conferences, and you know these coaches and GMs are doing their best to tap dance around, but how do you sort of decide, I think I got something here, or that's something that the audience should be aware of? Well, first of all, uh, Jason Wallers, who's the Packers uh, head of media relations, deserves a shout out for orchestrating the Brian Gutekunst experience yesterday. Because what they did was they did like a 30 minute session with the Packers beat reporters at like at the hotel. So then in the time it took Gutekunst to walk from the hotel to the podium, all the relevant quotes were being tweeted. There was nothing left. Gutekunst gets up there and goes, guys, so I just, you know. You probably saw, I said, haven't talked to Aaron, not a lot on that front. So what else you got? Gutekunst was only on the podium for seven minutes, probably the shortest podium session in combine history, (laughs) because at this point, it's reflective of the fact that there's only so much the Packers can do. Aaron Rodgers has control over the situation because he's got $60 million fully guaranteed because he would need to rework his contract, whether to come back to Green Bay or to be traded to help the Packers salary cap and also he could simply refuse to show up so the Packers have tried to be patient here there I'm sure are lessons learned from 2008 when the Packers pressed Brett Favre for a decision he ends up retiring in early March because at that point he didn't think he could play by the end of April he's already getting the itch and wants to come back to the NFL and that obviously led to drama over the entire summer but make no mistake the clock is ticking here the Packers need some answers in terms of setting their free agency plans we're 12 days away from the free agent negotiating window opening up. And the first step in this process is Aaron Rodgers saying, number one, does he want to play? Because he hasn't communicated that yet. Number two, does he want to play in Green Bay? And even if the answer is he wants to play in Green Bay, then Gutekunst alluded to it. There are additional conversations that need to be had just to make sure that everybody is on the same page about the direction of the roster, the team, the organization moving forward. This feels like they've decided to divorce, but they're working on the language to tell the children and then to tell the uh, parents. I just, there's just too much there that it just feels like they're down the road on this. And I don't know if Aaron wants to play again. I don't know if he wants to play elsewhere, but if I'm Green Bay, I got to move on. I, you know, I, I just have to decide I can't let him hold us hostage anymore we have to build a team and if Jordan Love is that quarterback and you really think that he can play then move forward but and I don't the issue they have though is they you know they can't unilaterally make that decision they have to make the decisions with Aaron and I think that one of the things that's been misconstrued is this relationship is predominantly positive and has been for a couple of years since they hashed out their differences back in 2021 and at that time, they adjusted Rodgers' contract. They deleted a year. Yeah. Last year, they signed him to an extension that the Packers, quite frankly, believed would buy them at least one offseason without the drama. And yet, here we are talking about darkness retreats and psychedelic podcasts and trying to decide the future here. They have Jordan Love. They got a glimpse of him in Philadelphia. And more importantly, they have three years of watching Jordan Love every single day in practice. All that tape seeing his progression, and Gutekunst has has said it publicly, the next step is for Jordan to play. I don't see a scenario, quite frankly, where Jordan Love is on any other roster than the Packers roster in 2023. They can exercise the fifth-year option. That buys them at least into 2024. Obviously, you got franchise tags on top of it. You don't expect that you're going to get to that road, and it's highly unusual to have a first-round quarterback or any quarterback sit for four years, but – this is also a unique deal and has been with Aaron Rodgers. And they, again, they believed that they were going to have Aaron for at least a couple of years when they did that contract. The fact that he's thinking about it now means he has the power based on a contract that if the Packers are going to get out of it, it's actually better for them for him to retire this off season, the next off season, but they simply don't know. Tom Pelissero, NFL Network reporter, joining us from the Combine. I also hate when I hear reporters or analysts say, I'm so tired of the Aaron Rodgers drama. I don't give a damn about your feelings. You still have to cover it because it affects the Packers. It could affect the Jets. It could affect the Raiders, affect Jordan Love. We may not like it, but it feels like there's a real story here. How do you approach well, this? this? Was, 
Well, for me, yes, it's, you know, been several years of waking up every day and not knowing what Aaron Rodgers might say or do and how that might impact the course of my day, week, month, year. (laughs) Pales in comparison to the Packers wondering, you know, hey, this guy still gives us the best chance to win in 2023, but does he want to be here? Is he going to be bought in? If he is, is he going to be traded? Is he just going to say, I'm done and I've made enough money and I've won four MVPs and it's enough already? Um, you know, from our perspective here, I think that you go back to last off season and you think about how those trades came together. They all, everything bared on the next deal. You had the Deshaun Watson situation where obviously there's serious allegations of sexual misconduct and things that played a role in this, but he had a longstanding trade request. The Texans basically said, here's the price. If you meet it, you can talk to him. Four different teams did. Everybody's bidding against each other, so it was basically free agency. The Browns are told they're out, which causes Baker Mayfield to request a trade after he sees that you know he's they're trying to move on at that position. Then they end up getting back in by giving a fully guaranteed contract. Meanwhile, the Falcons also took a run at Deshaun Watson, which makes Matt Ryan go, yeah, I think we're done here. So then he becomes available, ends up with the Colts. Meanwhile, the Russell Wilson trade gets done. <laughs> that causes panic to set in for the commanders. They drastically up their offer for Carson Wentz, so then they get Wentz. If you think back on all those trades I just mentioned, there's not a high success rate on any of these. I mean, the Colts, I don't anticipate. We'll see, but I don't anticipate that Matt Ryan's going to be a part of their plans this year. Carson Wentz has already been cut. The first year of Russell Wilson, obviously, was not good in Denver. And with Deshaun Watson, he hadn't played football in two years. It didn't look great, but it's, you know, 2023 will be a much more uh, fair judge of it. So, you know, in this case, you've got the Derek Carr situation. He's here in Indianapolis meeting with team executives and owners as his free agency carries forward here. I know his brother David said on NFL Network, you know, he's going to take his time, talk with a lot of people. Well, quite frankly, the best offer for Derek Carr may not come until we know what's happening with Aaron Rodgers. Lamar Jackson, John Harbaugh and uh, Eric DaCosta are going to speak today. There's no signs at this point that a deal is close there. And so ultimately, you're going to tag him. We'll see if it's the exclusive or the non-exclusive tag. There is a scenario where they trade Lamar Jackson for a windfall of draft picks. The Daniel Jones situation continues to play out. Baker Mayfield, who eventually was traded last year to the Panthers, and then ends up with the Rams, who didn't have Matthew Stafford, a year after Stafford was the big domino in the whole thing, and kind of set the stage for how all these other teams are approaching this with saying, hey, the guy's available, we're moving forward make your best offers and we'll work it out. You know, all these things are happening. And this is a league, Dan, where five years ago, 10 years ago, there weren't trades. Nobody was trading. These things didn't happen. Yeah. You'd have the, you know, the offhand occurrence where somebody at Carson Palmer became available or, you know, Brett Favre who ended up being traded to the Jets, but it wasn't a regular basis where last year we had, I want to say it was 10 trades involving pro bowl players in a two week or 17 day span. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, you're once again talking about all these quarterback dominoes leaning on one another. The moment the first one falls, and we'll see what happens with Derek Carr, but quite possibly that will be Aaron Rodgers declaring his intentions. Once that happens, I would anticipate a lot of these other things begin to move swiftly. What kind of leverage does Derek Carr have? Derek Carr's leverage is that he's a free agent. These other guys we're talking about, you need to trade for them. So, you know, if you're looking at Derek Carr versus Jimmy Garoppolo, who has won more games, been to more playoffs, and won more playoff games than Derek Carr, but also has been hurt substantially more uh, than Derek Carr through his career. So you're evaluating him. You're evaluating Baker Mayfield. You're potentially evaluating Daniel Jones, who would be shocking if the Giants did not end up franchise tagging him if they can't work out uh, a long-term deal here. So you know the question you have to ask yourself if you're Derek Carr and his agent, Tim Younger, is, our, is our best offer going to come right now? Do we have an offer we feel comfortable taking? Because potentially, if Aaron Rodgers goes back to Green Bay, now all the seats are open and we've got all the leverage. If Aaron Rodgers gets himself traded and Lamar gets himself traded, now it's the best seat there for Derek Carr. And so there, there's definitely a strategy to this entire thing. His leverage is, I'm available now. You can get me now and solve all your problems and you don't have to give up a pick to get me. You know, the Saints and Raiders had agreed to the framework of a trade when he took that visit, but his contract at that time was an issue. The Saints are still in it. The Jets are still in it. The Panthers, David Tepper actually flew here to Indianapolis to meet with Derek Carr last night. If all those teams make offers and they're in line with what Derek Carr thinks he should be making, he potentially could choose his spot. 
The question is, is his best leverage now or does it come after we find out where some of these other things land? How important is Bryce Young's height? Not as important as Bryce Young's weight and his frame. Talking to you know a variety of different scouts here over the course of the week, we've seen short quarterbacks go number one. You know, Baker Mayfield was six foot. Kyler is, I don't know what he's listed at, so I don't want to short sell him. Let's call him 5'11". Uh, but they're shorter quarterbacks. But those guys are thickly built. You know, Kyler was like 208 pounds. Go back to Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson, like Kyler, was a baseball player. Baseball players usually have, they're thicker, they're densely built. Bryce Young was listed at six foot 194 by Alabama. Talking to scouts who like went through the school, they say he's maybe 5'11", and the quarterbacks don't measure until I think, I believe Saturday. And they were told he was playing at 186. There's not a lot of precedent for 186 pound quarterback. Now toss on top of it, the Bryce Young was only hit like 15 times or something last season. He's playing behind five future NFL offensive linemen. So he's got the best protection possible, and he still suffered an AC joint injury that impacted him uh, for a good chunk of the season. So what you have to ask is, listen, everything about Bryce Young checks the boxes for teams except for this in terms of great kid, process as well, from a pro-style offense, can really throw it. It's just can he hold up. It's a 17-game season. Now, we'll see what he weighs in at. You know, he may well be close to 200 pounds by the time he gets there. But you have to ask yourself that. And I think that that goes back to, you know, Lamar Jackson. There was some of the same debate, which was when he was coming out through his lower body, he had a thinner type of a build. Well, what's happened to Lamar Jackson over the past couple of seasons? He's had a bone bruise in his ankle and he's had a knee injury that cost him December and January in consecutive seasons. You know, there's a lot of that. And I know that it's, it's in vogue to like rip on the, the unnamed scouts and some of the opinions and that. Well, like a lot of the stuff, especially the factual things, build and things like that, end up coming true. If you think coming in that there are going to be durability questions once a guy gets into the NFL, take Tua. Tends to play out that way. With Bryce Young, we'll see. You know, He's clearly, a t- just in terms of what he is as a polished product right now, he's the guy who makes sense as the number one pick. There's just not Preston out there for drafting a 186-pound quarterback, especially not number one. That's the thing when, you know, I look at the Bears situation. If there was a can't miss or I thought can't miss, uh, and maybe that's a Caleb Williams, then I would I would consider trading Justin Fields. If I knew that I could get that guy, reset the clock, my rookie quarterback contract, and, you know, I'm, I'm able to build. Uh, now I got my quarterback. And how many times have we said that about the, sh- you know, Chicago Bears? Hey, you got a franchise quarterback. But I just don't know about any of these quarterbacks. And as a result, you know, probably I would keep Justin Fields because I'm, I'm just not sure that any of these quarterbacks are going to walk in and remind us of Patrick Mahomes. The calculation you have to make here is no team ever wants to be drafted number one twice. It happens. You know, Jaguars did it. You know, it is possible to lose that many games after drafted number one, but you don't want to ever be in that position again. So the way that I would say it with what the Bears' options are here is they have scenarios for everything, depending do they get offers for the pick, depending if they fall in love with the quarterback, depending do any of these defensive players, whether it's Will Anderson or Tyree Wilson or Jalen Carter, do any of them, you know, jump out through the course of this process and they go, we just we can't afford to take the guy number one. I would also say there's going to be a lot made of, you know, the idea that they're going to they're going to trade that pick. Listen, every team in my 20 years covering the league who had the number one pick and did not have an urgent quarterback need, wanted to trade it. Because, you know, in the old days, pre-2011, the contracts were so astronomical. You're giving Sam Bradford $78 or whatever guaranteed coming out of college when he hasn't played it down. Even now in the slotted system, you still would rather move back because, you know, you move back two spots, three spots, you're picking up a future first-round pick. That's how valuable it is according to every trade chart. But somebody's going to want to give – has to want to give you that pick. So the real question is, are any of these guys somebody that other teams below, whether it's the Texans at two, the Colts at four, do any of them go, we just, we have to get up to number one and take this guy. And to your point, Dan, I don't know. And we'll see the process always kind of has this stuff shake out. Is there going to be somebody that everybody's really comfortable with the questions on Bryce young? We just covered it. It's just going to be the the frame and the durability. 
You got C.J. Stroud, obviously highly productive passer at Ohio State, but there have been a lot of highly productive passers at Ohio State. They all come in with some level of the same you know, question to them. I wouldn't even call it an issue because it can be overcome, but the, the question is, can they read things the way that NFL quarterbacks do because they're just taught differently? They're taught what Ryan Day does with them is just different than what they're asked to do in the NFL. With Will Levis, it's going to be, you know, can he just kind of put it all together? Does he have the poise? Last year was a rough year at Kentucky, but he had, nobody knew how hurt Will Levis was last year. He had a really serious turf toe injury that he kept re-aggravating over and over, which anybody who's ever had serious turf toe knows. I mean, you can barely walk, much less go out there and play quarterback. And he had a, a non-throwing shoulder injury. So that really impacted his mobility. He was having to shoot up the toe and the shoulder on a weekly basis. So, you know, he didn't go to the Senior Bowl. He is going to throw here in Indianapolis, so you'll get a view on him. And then you get Anthony Richardson, who is a traits player all the way. He's got the big arm. He's got the athletic <laughs> ability, height, weight, speed, all that. But as one high-ranking executive who I trust told me, like, quarterback isn't a traits position. You normally don't draft a guy who's a one-year starter at quarterback who hasn't really had the productivity because you think you can just make him into something at the next level. You don't draft that guy in the first. You might draft him in the fourth. But Anthony Richardson, people would be shocked within the league if he doesn't go in the first round. He's going to do everything out here. I mean, he's going to have a crazy workout, I'm sure, with 40 and the vertical and the broad jump and all that stuff. We're all going to be going, oh, my goodness, this athlete. Then you got to dig into, okay, can the quarterback develop through the course of time? You're absolutely right. There's holes in all these guys. I don't know that you're sitting there feeling comfortable taking any of them. But number one, that can certainly evolve through the process. Those guys generally get pushed up here. But, you know, the good news for the Bears is you are sitting in a good spot where you can get whoever you want, whether you can trade down. It's easy to say, yeah, we want to trade down. We're going to trade down. Somebody's got to be willing to make it worth your while. Always great to talk to you, Tom. Have fun there in uh, Indianapolis. Appreciate it, Dan. Thanks. Uh, Tom Pelissero, great NFL reporter for the NFL Network. Their scouting combine coverage is uh, today through uh, March 5th.